Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We are finishing our look at the book of Ezekiel today. We have walked through what it is as a category of prophetic literature. We've seen the coming of God on his throne chariot in Babylon instead of where it belongs in Israel. And we've seen why in the last episode with all the horrific sin and idolatry that's happened mm -hmm. portrayed in really graphic detail by Ezekiel. That's what we've covered in the last three episodes. And today we're looking at how on earth with the depth of depravity and brokenness and covenant breaking that Israel has gotten to, how is God going to turn this story right? Yeah. And how giant must his grace be to even consider doing it. Yeah, that's exactly where we're going. And I'm very excited. We uh, we talked early, maybe the very first episode. It's like one way to read the book of Ezekiel is by just following the throne chariot and yeah. where it goes. Where is God? Where is God? It shows up in Babylon. Why is it there? Well, let me show you why it's there, which is chapters 8 through 33. Mm -hmm. And then the very ha back of the book in chapter 43, specifically the throne chariot comes back to Israel mm -hmm. and all the things that happen on how it gets there. So, yeah. Yes. So I think one of the most interesting things you said to me was that uh, it's actually kind of difficult to talk about Ezekiel uh, in this context because actually so much of how we talk about and process what Jesus did, who Jesus is, what the end of our story will be actually comes from Ezekiel and we yes. talk about it all the time. Yes. If you've ever thought about Jesus as a good shepherd, that's in Ezekiel. <laughs> if you've ever thought about the way that Jesus transforms our hearts and fills us with the spirit, that's in Ezekiel. You've probably heard like the Valley of Dry Bones and these bones like coming back to life resurrection life that's an ezekiel too if you thought about like a new heavens and a new earth that's an ezekiel <laughs> if you thought about like uh, and the one that might be the most unique to ezekiel is like the idea of a new temple mm. uh that's also an ezekiel but really the big categories that we talk about what jesus does for us like a new covenant with transformed hearts that's led by a good shepherd like that's all ezekiel language yeah so it, what, i think what we're saying here is that you are probably far more influenced by the book of Ezekiel than you may even realize. Yeah. And so we're going to do a little whistle stop tour through a few of those mm -hmm. moments. And then we're going to camp out in the new temple section because that one has a ton of detail. The narrative really slows down there and really slows he down. wants to <laughs> really slows down, <laughs> really slows down. I hope you're ready for an incredible amount of numbers. I am not, but cubits upon oh cubits of numbers. Well, let me <laughs> let me get some fuel in my tank for that. Yeah. Uh, by starting with what well, one of the first things we said, uh, Jesus is the the shepherd king. Mm -hmm. You said that comes from Ezekiel. Yes. What? So, where? I could. I mean, I, if you asked me, I couldn't place it. So in Ezekiel, so we said the first half of Ezekiel is all like prophecies of doom and destruction yeah. given in like that first five years, uh, or in the, in the span of five years, mm -hmm. and it ends in chapter thirty three when somebody comes announcing that Jerusalem has fallen. Right. And it's this devastating like description of the fall of the hope of God's people. Yeah. But immediately in chapter 34, Ezekiel pops back up and he says, the reason Jerusalem has fallen is because your leadership was corrupt. Mm -hmm. Your leadership taught you to worship idols. Your leadership taught you how to be unjust. It perpetuated everything that caused this destruction. However, God's going to send you a new leader. Mm -hmm. And the way that he talks about the, the leaders of Israel as, as the shepherds of Israel. You were like sheep Israel and your shepherds led you down the wrong path, mm -hmm. but God's going to give you a new shepherd. And this is what he says in verse 11. This is what the Lord says, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered. So I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. So one of the things that happens when, you know, Babylon comes in and destroys Israel, it yeah. scatters the people. Totally. All over the Babylonian Empire, some flee to Egypt, some stay in Israel, some are already in Babylon. They just scattered everywhere. The lost sheep of Israel. That's right. And God says, like, I'm going to, there's going to be coming a day when mm. I, like a shepherd, will gather you all back again. And that's actually when Jesus, right before he um, performs the miracle, of the multiplying of loaves and fishes. Mm -hmm. He looks out over the people and he says, I have compassion on them as a shepherd who has compassion on the sheep. Yeah, because uh, they are to me like a sheep without a shepherd, yeah, right? Like a sheep oh, without a shepherd. man. So he, what's amazing to me about that is I always just think about shepherds and sheep. 
mm-hmm. you know, whenever I hear that. And it's a pretty compelling metaphor. A shepherd yes. caring for an, a, a dumb animal. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm a dumb animal. I, I wander around. I <laughs> yeah. get close to a cliff. Yeah. And it's like, oh, no. If he's pulling on Ezekiel, which he is, then actually these sheep are evil sheep. They're black sheep. Uh, they have they have done horrible things. Mm-hmm. And they've been scattered not because they're stupid and they wandered off, but they've been kicked out in judgment mm-hmm. and put out to other pastures under other shepherds. Mm-hmm. And they deserve to be there. Mm-hmm. It was their just punishment to be scattered mm-hmm. to that land. And Jesus is like, I'll have compassion on them. Yeah. Like, how? You just you sent just... them into exile and said that was good and covenant keeping for you to do that. And it breaks your heart. Yeah. And you run after them, yes. after your scattered sheep. Yes. <laughs> so good. He even, yeah. Yeah. I w- verse, this is verse 15. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Mm. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God, the covenant God, the mm. Yah- Yahweh God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. Um, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. Mm. And I will feed them justice. And so he, Jesus, or God, even in these passages, talks about the difference between good sheep and bad sheep mm. and how the corrupt shepherd sheep of israel Mm -hmm. like like will be taken from the flock and the good sheep will be held in his hand in justice and in love Mm. yeah what also what else is is there that because i know last episode we talked about how so much of israel's leaders Mm -hmm. so many of their shepherds Mm -hmm. you know jeremiah crawled through the walls to see what was going on with them and it's, they, they were rotten to their core. Yeah. Their leaders were so hypocritical and were leading them into bad pastures and into exile through their disobedience. Not only is it good news that Jesus is a shepherd who seeks out his scattered sheep and shows mm-hmm. grace to those who deserve justice. Mm-hmm. He also then leads them as a new shepherd, as a new leader, as a new yes. elder, as a new priest. Like that's also very good news, right? That is very good news. Can you unpack yes. that more? The for idea us? that Jesus is the the, or the, the the leader we need, the not only yeah. a shepherd who comes to a sheep but leads us to new places. I kept just thinking about John ten and the way that yep. Jesus talks about himself as the good shepherd. As the good shepherd, this is what Jesus says in John ten verse seven: "Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep, and all who came before me are thieves and robbers." Mm. So it's like. Yep. A similar situation to Ezekiel's day, right? Yep. That all who came before the good shepherd Jesus were thieves and robbers, kind of like the Pharisees of Jesus's day, leading people people astray. Um, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief, these corrupt leaders, come only to steal and kill and destroy. But I came they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them up and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But Mm. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own knows me. Mm. None, and then he says a little bit later, or a little bit before this, none will snatch them out of my hand. Okay, yes, I see. Jesus is setting himself up as a completely different leader than all the leaders they've had before. Yeah. All the other leaders were there for the wrong reasons. They were fickle. And anytime there's a problem, they'd bail. Jesus is like, I'm the one who was always with you, will always protect you, will always lead you to the right places. I'm unlike any other priest, king, ruler, elder, shepherd you've ever had before. Yes. Um, and I'm what you've always needed. <laughs> I've also always needed, and I will give up my life for you. Yeah. None of your kings have done this for you, That's Israel. Right. They all looked out for their own self-interest. I will not. Mm. I will be a good shepherd. Yeah. I'll sac- self-sacrificial shepherd for you, my sinful, horrifically poorly behaved sheep. <laughs> I will be your good shepherd. <laughs> yes. Okay, so that's that's a little whistle stop at yes. the at the Good Shepherd. Yes. Um, we you also mentioned that um, another huge part of the Christian worldview is that God gives us a new heart in Jesus. He fills us with the Spirit, gives us a new heart, 
That's also from Ezekiel. That's also from Ezekiel. He Ezekiel talks about actually throughout his book, like little hints okay. throughout his book. But the big phrase is in Ezekiel 36, uh, verses 24 mm-hmm. through 29, where he says this. Um, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. So he's gathering the scattered sheep. Just let's the same type of metaphor. Okay, you're yes. scattered out. I'm going to gather you back in. And when I get you back in, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean, clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will clean you hmm. and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Hmm. It's like we talk about this idea all the time that we have a heart of stone that's yep. stubborn, hard-hearted to the, towards the thing of things of God, but that in the moment that God saves us, he softens that and allows it and makes us want to obey our Lord mm. and worship him. Yeah. And which is, I think, kind of scandalous to think about what's what he's saying there. He's like, you are hard hearted. All of us are hard hearted by nature, yeah. by virtue of the choices that we have made and by virtue of our birth. We do not want God. Right. And so God, seeing no other choice for horrifically sinful sheep, says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change their hearts hearts by my own power. (laughs) Um, In grace, I am going to change them so that they would be my sheep and my people forever. Mm. Um, And so what you're saying is there, too, that we get a picture in all the bad leaders and the idol worship and the injustice. We get a picture of what a stone heart looks like we do is That's exactly that right they have all the laws they've got god in their temple they're, they're got, even obeying some of the laws yeah they, whitewashed walls right <laughs> yeah uh, that's right but they have everything needed to do right by god everything except the ability to do it yes their hearts are hard and god in his grace is saying a new time is going to come mm-hmm. when i will actually give you the ability to follow my commandments, not only the ability, I will give you such a heart that makes you do it. You'll yeah. have the compulsion yeah. that you just start wanting these things. Yes. It's like the old hymn says, uh, hast thou not seen how thou desires have been granted in what he ordaineth? Yeah. And it's like all of a sudden, like, I, mm-hmm. like not, maybe not all of a sudden, but progressively over time. over time, as I become more sanctified, I start wanting what God wants and yes. my desires start changing. Like, what happened? The things I used to love, I hate. The things I used to hate, I love. The things I used to avoid, I run into. Like, yeah. what's happening? Oh, he's changing my heart. Yeah. That's amazing. And he does it not by throwing more rules on us. Or it's like, oh, I better right. not do these things. He changes from the inside. And not because the sheep has suddenly reformed themselves. That's right. He does it so that the sheep might be reformed. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yes. Um, because he's shown that they will not reform themselves, cannot reform themselves by their own devices. Yeah. There needs to be a sovereign act of grace. And if the sheep could re- earn it, it wouldn't be grace anymore. That's right. It is like God is doing something. He's turning stone into skin. Yeah. And like the, that is supernatural. That's supernatural. And that's why you said at the beginning that it's scandalous. That's right. Because this is not the anthropological worldview we have of ourselves, that we are masters of our own fate. We can do what we want. I could be good and virtuous if I chose to, Yeah. but I'm choosing to live a different kind of life right now. Right. And it's like, actually, you have a stone heart. That's right. And you need a miracle to happen on it. Yeah, and in the case of Israel, it's like your your leaders taught you that way, mm. and you have like been led astray by your bad shepherds to trust your own efforts and your own self. Mm. And God's saying, "Okay, I'm just going to undercut all that. Yeah. I'll give you a new shepherd. I'm going to give you a new heart. Yeah. We're going to start again." So, where do we see that fulfillment then in the ministry of Jesus? Ah, uh, maybe the Book of John is most helpful mm. here. Okay, uh, I mean. You'll have the epistles pick up on this often. Second Corinthians will talk about this. Yes. Romans talks about uh, about this. Um, but John says it this way in John six sixty three, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. And the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Mm. Um, like the, uh, Jesus understands that the way that people are transformed 
is not through moral reformation, mm. but by his spirit. And the work that Ezekiel is describing when he puts his spirit in, in us is what Jesus says he's come to do. It's a spirit who gives life and the flesh is no help at all. I must go so that the spirit may come mm. so that you can have the heart of flesh. Like yeah. Jesus understands that the purpose of his death, his resurrection, and then his ultimate ascension, never to come back to earth again, is so that his spirit may enter into us so that we might have hearts of flesh. Like mm, the, right, yeah. right? I think it's amazing too that uh, what Jesus says in chapter six of John is aiming at the exact same thing you've been saying all along that Ezekiel's aiming at. The focus of Ezekiel was that you may know the Lord your God. Yeah. And Jesus, you know, he's saying, hey, we're going to have eternal life. There's going to be hearts of flesh. And they're like, cool. How do we get that? What's the work? What's the good thing we got to do to get that good stuff? Because we want it. And Jesus says, believe in me. Yeah. Know the Lord your God. <laughs> and your heart's changed. Yeah. And it's like what Ezekiel's aiming at, what Jesus is aiming at are the same thing. Yes. It's just know God and be transformed. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. And it's, I just, I was thinking in the, the context of this, of how um, Jesus says, it's better that I go away. Yeah. Which is always like, you know, people are like, oh, that's crazy. That <laughs> yeah, he's it's like, like, it's like, I would rather Jesus here and like doing miracles and stuff uh, out, outside of me. Yeah. But Jesus uh, believes and knows that it's better if his Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Yeah. Because then we will know who God is. We will be transformed the way that God wants to be transformed in a deeper and better way than if Jesus was standing beside us. I've never thought about it that way. Look at the the disciples before Jesus' ascension and yep. after it. Yep. Before they're bumbling, they miss they miss all the teachings. Yeah. They're denying, they're fleeing, and then because Jesus is outside of them. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then after Pentecost, Jesus comes inside, inside of, of them, them and they're bold and they're zealous and they're miracle working and they're changing the world. Yeah. And that's the difference. That's why it's better yeah. is because Jesus is inside of you giving you a new heart. And think about the Crazy. way that the spirit has been used throughout the book of Ezekiel so far. Okay. Yeah. He showed up on the throne chariot He's thing. on the throne chariot. It is what animates the wheels and the creatures to move wherever it will. Yes. When the spirit enters into Ezekiel, it's what gets him up off the ground. Oh. And in a second, well, let's just go there right now. In Ezekiel 37, God brings him in the spirit by the way, to this weird, this wilderness place full of dead bones. Or okay. I guess all bones are dead, but like it's just a full of bones, bo dry bones everywhere. And he asks uh, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Mm. Really famous yep. part of scripture. And Ezekiel says, oh Lord. You know. You know if they could be. I, I don't know. And think about what what's being, here's, oh. I got so much to say. Okay. It's just spilling out of me Go so fast. It. These bones, in verse 11, we're told who they are. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, these bones say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. And indeed, we are cut off. Hmm. So God gives Ezekiel this vision of Israel's spiritual state as they are yet living. Yeah. They're like a whole bunch of dried bones. Their sin is horrific, like this chronic adulterer. Yeah. Like wor worshiping spiders, bad. They are awful. They're and they know it. And they're dead. And they're just dead. They're so dead. A bunch of bones yeah. in, in, in a mass grave. Okay. That's what they are. Can these bones live? I mean, I would have just said no. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And that's why Ezekiel's like, uh. I feel like it's a trick question. I feel like it's a trick question, God. <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic back to you, God. <laughs> I think you know if these bones can live. Is there any hope for God's people? Is the covenant still in effect? Mm. It doesn't seem like it's in effect. Jerusalem's burned to the ground. Can these bones live? Right. And then God says to uh, Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. Say to them, thus says the Lord. <laughs> Which is what he's been doing in his whole ministry. That's right. Yeah, yeah. He's been prophesying to dead bones yes. the whole time. Yes. That's just funny. I've always viewed that as like a really weird statement. Prophesy, Prophesy to the bones. Yes. It's like, what? Why? It's like, oh, if it's a metaphor for the dead state of Israel, mm -hmm. he's been doing that his whole career. Yes, he anyway. has been. Yeah. Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. Oh, my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know 
that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and raise you from the dead, O my people. And I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Oh. I have spoken. I will do it, declares Yahweh. <laughs> Context is helpful. Yes. So can I yes, take go. a stab at a few things yes. here? Because I just always thought, resurrection passage. Right. But it's like, oh, okay, but this is... The the dead I, dead Israel has been their bones have been scattered across the nations and they've been kicked out and exiled and he says I'm going to bring you back into the land yeah and I'm going to give you a new spirit mm-hmm. and you'll live in the land and yeah. so this is a a restoration or a forgiveness yeah passage that's right it's and not it's, necessarily a, a resurrection one it's a picture of resurrection. it's a picture of resurrection and like yes we should we are not wrong and assume like God is able yes. to raise bones and bring them back to life yeah absolutely right but the purpose here is not that is god able but is god willing Ooh, because that's good because that's what that's ian do good i was like oh, i got that line from ian do good I mean, that makes is sense. god yeah it, it's because that's the question on the line uh, we if we're sinful as ezekiel says we are mm. is god willing yeah to of heal course us? god's able Right, but is he willing? But is he willing? And the answer is yes. Oh man, that's uh, why. So that's why Ezekiel says to him, "Lord, you know, you know." He's like, "We both know you could." Yeah. But God, you're gonna have to answer for your own heart. Will you? Will Are you, you willing? And God's yeah. like, "Oh, I'm so willing." I'm so- tell the bones, I forgive them. Yes. Ah, oh, that's so that's good. Too good. It's so good. <laughs> and, uh, okay, but also linking back because we jumped here from the spirit passage. Yes. And so. Again, we see the spirit again taking a dead thing like a like a stone heart. This time it's dry bones. Yes, and bringing it to flesh and life. Mm-hmm. Same thing. That's exactly again. right. Okay. Yeah. And yes, very much so. And oh, even yeah. like these dead bones, like grow up, skin get bo- like muscle gets sewn yeah. around them, skin gets thrown around them, and then the spirit breathes into them. Mm, new it's creation. New creation. Mm. This is like Paul talks about this in Christ. We are new creations. Like. Just to prove the point that yeah. Ezekiel's all over our Old Testaments, like this idea is everywhere. Yeah. What were you going to say? I was going to say, like, talk to me a little bit more about like the spirit and new creation. Okay. Like, like we're, we're in metaphorical worlds mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. and we're in Bible connection hyperlink world. Mm-hmm. Very practically speaking, what is the spirit's role in this new creation work that God wants to do. Why do we need it? Why is that the mechanism? Why is of the new spirit? Creation? The why is the spirit the mechanism? I mean, I guess the best answer is like that's the way He's always done it. Oh, like all the way back to Genesis one. I mean, that's how Adam first came to life. Mm, that's uh, how everything came to. Life. That's how everything <laughs> came to life was when the spirit hovered over the waters. You don't get more dead than the vast voidness of uncreation. Right. Yeah. Um, God always brings dead things to life by his spirit. Mm. And so it makes sense that in the new era of God's dealing with humanity, it would be by his spirit. Yeah. I mean, um, what is his spirit? It's his person. Yes. Right. And so the only way we live is through him and in him, animated by him, carried on by his breath. Yes. And it's like, if you want to live, like really live. Yeah. You got to do it in partnership with me because yeah. I am life. Yeah. You separate from life, you die. It's mm-hmm. like Jesus says, like, I'm the vine. Right. You know, you're and the interestingly, branch. like, the so far in Ezekiel, the spirit is connected to movement. Okay. The move, it's like by the spirit that the throne chariot moves. Right. It's by the spirit that, like, Ezekiel's raised up from the ground. The it's spirit by the, m- moves the bones back into. Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, it re- reorganizes yeah. all the bones, it connects them, right? So like the the idea that now that the world has gone from chaos to order by the spirit. Well, we're in a disordered state, but we're still living now. Mm. So in order to move into the new covenant era, mm-hmm. we need the same movement movement power of of the Holy Spirit. Yep. We must we have to have the Holy Spirit that moves as we move forward into the mm. new things that God's building for us. Yeah. Amazing. There's yeah. probably a lifetime to meditate. There's on there, so much we but... could talk about in Ezekiel. Okay. So that's that's the whistle stop tour. Yeah. Uh, now let's get into some math. Apparently. Oh my god. Everyone's been waiting for. Yes. Uh, I don't know how to tee this up. There's there's a new temple, but I don't know how we get yeah. there or what's going on. Yes, there is a whole category of things that we might not be as familiar with as we are about resurrection, new hearts, and a, she- a good shepherd. Yeah. It all starts in chapter 40, and for the next six chapters, 
Ezekiel is going to describe for us the dimensions of a new temple. The size of the walls, the size of the rooms, the dimensions of gates, and the size of altars, in excruciating detail. Like, insane amount of detail. He's going to describe the architecture of a new temple that will presumably replace the one that has been burned down. Okay. Oh, yes, because at this point, yeah. temple's gone. That's right. The, they have That's no right. temple. That's right. Their world is over. God has no house. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, what are we going to do? That's right. I hear, I hear all the promises of a new heart and resurrected bones mm-hmm. and a good shepherd, but I don't care if I have a new body with a new heart led by a new shepherd back into Jerusalem. Where's the temple? Where's God's presence? Yeah. What, like there's a huge missing piece to this right. narrative, Ezekiel. And it's like, yeah. here it is. And let me show you what it's what's going to look like. That's right. Okay. Before we dive into yeah. details, just for my sake and everyone else's yes. listening, why do the details matter? And why oh, is he going into them? I'm so happy. Before we like dive into them. Let's have a meta conversation. That would be helpful. When we th- read passages like this or when we read it back in exodus yes when like there's all these details about what the tabernacle is going to look like because back in exodus with the law this is the the other time yes. in excruciating detail we get we all, get the temple right we are a little overwhelmed by it mm-hmm. and it seems like way too much detail to be meaningful or helpful to us however and this was a very f- interesting thing for me to learn uh as i was reading this or studying for this podcast is that most people's interaction with the, the the temple itself would have been a, a literary experience. They're not actually going to it? For the people who had closest access to the tabernacle and the temple was a subset of the people of God, the mm-hmm. Levites. Right. They would have been the most familiar with the inner workings. They only had access to the Holy of Holies. There right. were some places only they could go. Mm. And for most people, they're not going to spend time measuring the walls anyway. They can look at it from afar away. They might visit it once a year for a special, a high holy day. Sure. Right. But in a big crowd far away, the right. details are going to get missed. Right. So people's first experience with the temple is actually probably a literary one. Wow. And their most common experience with it would be literary as well. Why? I've never thought of that. Right? Is that does that blow your that mind? That blows my mind. It also is kind of a comfort to me. Right. That <laughs> yes. it's like, oh, most of Israel's relationship to the temple is the same as mine. <laughs> yes. That yes. I only have a literary relationship with this structure. That's exactly right. And I don't know and I know about the different courts and where they were allowed. But it's right. like, oh, they know they had a deeper experience of what happened in yeah. the holy place. And it's like, nope, they had, they had the exact same experience I do. They might have been able to visit a few times during their lifetime. Sure. Uh, but it, I mean, yeah, it's the first, last, and most common experience mm. they would have had with the holiest place of God was through the literature that described it. Right. And so if you are really going to try to hear the story and the truth being communicated by this structure— you can't do it by spending hours in it. Right. You have to read about it or hear right. the story of it. And what that do, what that should tell us then is that the purpose of the details mm. is to communicate meaning other than architectural guidelines. It's not a blueprint. It's a theology. That's exactly right. Okay. So like the primary purpose of the numbers and the details isn't to give the builders of the tabernacle, the temple, the exact measurements they need to build the right bricks. Mm. Maybe that was used, but there's a whole bunch of details you need to know in order to build something that are not included in the temple and tabernacle structures. Mm. The purpose of them is to communicate to the people of God what God is like, what God is building, and how he's interacting with his his people. Mm. Does Does that make sense? Definitely. So when we look at the excruciating detail, we are not look. We shouldn't necessarily be looking to reconstruct it. We're not like, gosh, why am I reading a blueprint document? Like, right. Who cares? No, yeah. the The numbers are doing theology, and so yes. we should be reading it as a theological document more mm. than uh, than an architectural one. Okay. Um, I like that. Yes. Let's go. So that's a big meta note. This is how we should we should be experiencing it by reading it. Okay. And let's look at the details to find some interesting facts. One last thing. Yes. For all of us listening, 
what is a temple? <laughs> a temple was um, in the in Israel's mind uh, was the place where God and man met. Mm. It's where God's presence could meet a human representative, the high priest. Where heaven and earth overlap. Heaven and earth overlap. Okay. And the relationship between God and man was mediated and like crossed over. That's where the friction between heaven and earth comes together. That's right. Okay. And so if you wanted to be forgiven of a sin, uh -huh. if you wanted God's blessing, if you wanted... Your prayers to be extra heard or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you Or just to experience God's presence. Yep. It happened at the temple. Okay. It happened at the temple. So this is where heaven and earth come together, where God can be met and experienced. Yes. It's at a temple. Because yes. that's different for our most of our worldview is like, mm -hmm. oh, God's everywhere. Meet him mm -hmm. wherever you want. Mm -hmm. And he's, no, he's not more in one place than another yeah. is our assumption. Right. And that's so right. for them, it's different. There's, it's localized. It's a localized, it's a localized hyper place. presence of yeah. God. Okay. Yes. Maybe one other meta note. Okay. As we, to just, to strengthen what we've been saying. Nowhere in the next six chapters are we, is anyone ever commanded to build this temple? Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> right? Is, is, is it already built? Is he just looking at it? it? It's a vision. It's a vision. He sees it in a vision. Okay. Of a temple. Of a temple. Yeah. Of a, this kind of, this, yeah. Okay. He, and and normally, like, you know, when Moses saw it on Mount Sinai. Oh, yeah. It's like, he was go get these materials and do these things with it. He was told to build it. We don't have quite the same parallel with Solomon's temple, but he's, like, using the original design. Yep. To and we actually get temple. a list of everything he used. And, That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, but here we're never told he's supposed to build it. Fascinating. It's also never called Mount Zion, which is a very common phrase throughout the Bible to to. To, to describe the place where God and man meet. Mm -hmm. So it, there's just some interesting things about it where I think we're supposed to encounter this as a theological man. Like we're supposed to encounter the temple. I think the same way that we've encountered the glory cloud previously, mm. the, the throne chariot is a physical manifestation of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And this temple is going to be a physical manifestation of the new creation itself. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. In the, so in the same way that we shouldn't, we're not going to learn a ton about what Ezekiel is communicating by drawing the best picture of the throne chariot and be like, what did it really look like? And can right. we reconstruct it? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. what's being communicated? That's right. Same thing here. So another way to say it would be that what we're about to read is a picture of God. Yeah. Or a picture of the world God wants to make. Okay. A picture yes. of the world God wants to make. Yes. Okay. Uh, so. Because, sorry. No, no, more no, note, no. Because for Israel, the temple was a picture of the world God wanted to make. Yeah. It was a little Eden. That's right. A little garden with pomegranates and garden imagery. And it was supposed to reflect yes. the picture of the world they lived in together. That's right. Eden. And so now it's like, okay, what, you know, where's new Jubilee, new creation, the the son of Adam is Ezekiel. What garden are we making together, God? Yes. Okay. That's right. That's helpful. So let's start in Ezekiel 40, uh, verse 1. In the 25th year of the exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was struck down, on that very day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me to the city. Now, we talked about this in the very first episode. Oh, yes. But this is a very, this dating thing is very interesting. So this is 25 years into the exile and 20 years since the first prophecy, right? Okay, yes. And the first prophecy was made, uh, we were told, in... Um, in uh, The 30th year? In the 30th year during the fifth year of our exile. Uh -huh. So 30 years plus 20 years later is 50 years. Does oh, that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. So we have... 50 years that's the year of jubilee this is the year of jubilee and so we talked about in the first episode how ezekiel is a prophet counting down to the ultimate jubilee mm -hmm. the release of the captives the release of slaves and the forgiveness of debts or the re the release of captives release. The, the recovery of the land recovery of the land yes and the uh the cancellation of debts that's right so he's been counting down to this moment and this is the 50th year in his reckoning mm -hmm. since he began chapter one and if you add up the, the numbers 25, 10, and 14, you get 49. Right, which um, is when the preparations for the year of Jubilee begin. That's right. And even this phrase, on the 10th day of the month, the 10th day of the month of the year prior, the 49th year, uh -huh. you were supposed to blow a trumpet and commemorate the year of Jubilee starting next. Okay. And so the fact that it's the 10th day of the month should 
hyperlink you back yep. to the Jubilee commandments. The fact that the numbers add up to 49, oh yes, we're on Jubilee mode. And the fact that we're in year 50. And the fact that we're in year 50 is, this is a Jubilee vision. Yes, Ezekiel's blowing the Jubilee trumpet. That's and right. saying, let me show you what the year of Jubilee looks like for God's people and God's yes. land. And maybe just to combine the images that we've been using before, this is the temple we're about to see is a physical representation of Jubilee. A physical representation of Jubilee. This is what, this is a freedom city. This is a freedom city. Okay, this is, this is what a city built on the tenets of forgiveness, freedom, and redemption looks like. Yes. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Freedom yes. city. Freedom city. Okay, freedom city. USA. No, a free, yeah, freedom <laughs> city, Israel. Israel. Well, actually, oh, that's a no, different, conversation. Never mind. different conversation. In visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain on which was a structure like a city uh, to the south. And when he brought me there, behold, there was a man whose appearance was like bronze with a linen cord and a measuring reed in his hand. And he was standing in the gateway. And the man said to me, son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears and set your heart on all that I will show you. For you were brought here in order that I might show it to you. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. So this is a vision that he's supposed to give to everybody. Okay. I'm going to show you something. You go tell people. Yes. Okay. Verse 5. And behold, there was a wall all around the outside of the temple area. And the length of the measuring reed in the man's hand was six long cubits, each being a cubit and a handbreadth in length. So he measured the thickness of the wall, one reed, and the height, one reed. And then he went into the gateway fa facing east, going up its steps, and measured the threshold of the gate, one reed deep. And the side rooms, one reed long, and one re reed broad, and the space between the side rooms, five cubits, and the threshold of the gate, of the vestibule of the gate, and the inner room, one reed. Then he measured the vestibule of the gateway on the inside, one reed. And then he measured, uh, you get the picture. I don't, but keep going. Yeah. But you get the, the, don't keep going, but keep going. You get the idea of the, the meticulous detail. Yes, I do get that. That impression. is happening right here. Yeah. He goes on to describe six little rooms, each one cubit by one cubit square in a vestibule that is 50 cubits long. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay, let's slow way down. Yes, or speed way up. <laughs> uh, either way, don't leave me where I am. So the first thing that we need to see is the significance of the thing in his hand, the reed in his hand, yes. the measuring reed. The six long cubit reed. And so what's fascinating about a long cubit uh -huh. is that a cubit, a long cubit is a cubit and a hand breadth. It means okay. nothing to you, right? Until this moment. <laughs> Are you ready for a cubit to be meaningful to you? <laughs> I'm actually very ready for that. I also am just laughing at the absurdity of being like, is that a, is that a, are you using a foot or a long foot? Is that a yard or a long yard? <laughs> the, a cubit was normally six hand breadths or six hand lengths, right? Okay. And so a long cubit is six hand lengths plus one. Seven. Seven. Yeah. This is a sabbatical rod. Yeah, a sabbatical rod. So everything in this new temple is measured against a sabbatical measure. Come on. <laughs> so this city is built on rest and freedom. I want to go there. <laughs> I want to go <laughs> there, right? Go there. And think about this. If your primary interaction with this vision is literary, that's exactly- I'm already crying. That's exactly what you should be feeling. Oh, yeah. this is a city built on a measure of rest and freedom. I want to go to, I there. Go to there. I want to go to there. Yeah. And then let me, I'm just going to, now I'll move a lot faster. Okay. First thing we're told is we walk seven steps up to the first level of the temple. Okay. Seven steps. Oh, wait, more rest. Sabbath steps. More Sabbath steps up. And when you get to walk up those seven steps, you enter into a gate and you walk down this hallway. And on each side of you, there are three, so six total. Um, guard houses okay. uh, measured by six by six. So it's just, it's creation language. It's just creation numbers. Yep. Oh, I'm walking up seven steps through six days of work that have already been completed uh, on either side of me. Yes. And that whole vestibule hallway is 50 cubits long. Uh, 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 which is the ultimate Sabbath. Which is the ultimate the ju Sabbath. A jubilee it's, hallway. It's a jubilee hallway. <laughs> So so it's like everything is measured 
by okay. a sabbatical measure. Yep. You walk up seven steps, a creation week of steps. You walk past six weeks of work already completed. Down Jubilee Hallway. Down 50 jubilee cubits of hallway, of Jubilee Hallway. Okay. Is, do you get what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. This is crazy. It's an architectural Sabbath. Yeah. It's a city based on Sabbath. City and, based on Sabbath. And if mm. you, and they are, as you go, this whole temple is described. There are seven gates. There's leading into the holiest of holies. Mm. After the first seven steps, you're going to go up six and then up another eight, totaling 25, half a jubilee. Mm. By the time you get to the holy of holies, you've walked up half a jubilee worth of steps. Like, in, it's just a good number. Yeah. In this case. Yes. It's like, oh, we're in Jubilee math territory. We're right in the middle of Jubilee. We're right in the middle of ju <laughs> a Jubilee cycle. So everything in the... T so I, I think I'm making my point. Oh, absolutely. That yes. the whole city is measured and, art and built around Sabbath and Jubilee. Yeah. It's a temple of Sabbath and Jubilee. Um, and then, and once then. it's all built, okay. God's glory comes back. The is it is he back on the chariot? The ba the chariot throne comes back uh. in chapter forty three. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east, and behold, the glory of God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So, okay, uh, why is he coming from the east? Because I thought he had just he had ridden up north to Babylon, so I thought right. he'd be coming from the north. Well, the north is generally associated with the judgment. Oh, yes. When things come from the north, it's yep. a judgment. Like Jeremiah's pot. Yes, that's right. Okay. But when things come from the east, they're coming from the direction of Eden. Oh, so... Yeah. Okay, so the place of rest is riding to the new city of rest. That's right. Okay. Yeah, and this sound that's was cool. like many waters. The earth shines with his glory. Oh, it's, there's the Sinai mm -hmm. sounds again. Sinai sounds again. And Eden was a well-watered place. There was rivers everywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the vision was just like what I saw when, I was, uh, when he came to destroy the city. And just like the vision I'd seen by the uh, Kibar Canal. Mm -hmm. And I fell on my face as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. Hmm. And the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God's glory is back hmm. in Israel, just like the people of Israel would have hoped for. Um, which is incredible. Y After like, yeah. God's presence is in a city built on rest and freedom. Yeah. And God's people get to enter into that. Well, yeah, but what's even more incredible is... I'm just having whiplash between our last conversation and this one mm -hmm. where, you, I mean, you read me, we, we gave our first parental warning <laughs> yes, <laughs> to, in order to read some of the stuff from the Bible Yeah, in the last episode about the graphicness of people's sin and the necessity of their yeah. exile and destruction. Mm -hmm. And yet while they're away, God builds Celebration City. And like Freedom City and Sabbath Stairs and Jubilee Hall and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then comes and lives in it again. And I'm like, <laughs> how do you have the greatest <laughs> picture of his mercy and rest and glory on earth right next to some of the most graphic pictures of sin in that exact same city shoved together? Like, yeah. that is just... The, the paper thin line between them is just like the uh, yeah. written on it must just be the biggest word grace you've ever seen in your yeah. entire life. Another way you could say that is why is that the case? Like so that you would know that I am the Lord. Mm. This, yeah. this is the point. This is the point of the book. Right. That you would know that God hates sin and he loves his people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he will judge it, but he will restore them. Yeah. And this is what it means for God to be a covenant keeping God. Like that, it's like this is this is how you know that God is the Lord because what other God is going to watch you? Yeah, make a whore of yourself, right? And then give you a city of freedom and celebration, of freedom and of rest. celebration and rest. Oh, that's who God is. Okay, is it question time yet? It can be question time. I've got more to say. We got we haven't even got to the river of life. All right, keep flowing going. Flowing from Eden yet? I'll wait. Okay. So after he sees all this, after God's glory comes back. Um, this is what happens in chapter 47. There's more set. If you want to read all the chapters, there's a whole bunch more sevens and fifties and twenty fives. You can just take my word for it. Yes, I believe uh, you. Uh, then he brought me back to the door of the temple and behold, 
water was coming from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar, and then he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer court, and behold, the water was trickling out the south side. So he's just describing, it's like, okay, I saw this water drifting south, and then I wanted to follow it, and it was drifting out the east gate and towards the south. It's going southeast. That's, okay. That's the picture. But he can't go out the east gate because that's the, the gate that God came in. So he goes out the north gate to go around it. That's okay. what he's describing right <laughs> that's there. That's funny. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yes. <laughs> um, and then he goes eastward with a measuring line in his hand. And the man that's with him measured a thousand cubits. Out? Out, like out along the riverside. Okay. And then uh, and the water was ankle deep. And then he measured another thousand. And the water was now knee deep. And then he measured another thousand, and uh, it was waist deep. And then he measured another ha- thousand, and I couldn't swim in it. <laughs> uh, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, son of man, do you see this? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see <laughs> of course it. I, 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 I can't. I'm wet. I can't. <laughs> I, I see it. I experience it. And then he led me to the bank of the river. And as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river many trees on the one side and on the other. Uh, and he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. So okay. the Arabah is southeast of Jerusalem. It's a des- It's where the Dead Sea is. It's a desert land. Oh. It's where Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in the biblical narrative. Okay. And so this water is flowing through this dead, arid region. And when it hits oceans salty oceans it turns the salty oceans fresh <laughs> what <laughs> yeah yep yeah. and he continues to talk about there'll be a lot of fish there wherever this water goes there'll be life fishermen will stand beside the sea from engedi to englaim two cities around the araba uh it'll be a place for the spreading of nets fish of all kinds will be there like the fish of the mediterranean uh can, and, it, and he goes on but can, are you saying Yes. That a river goes out from the temple, mm-hmm. hits the Dead Sea, and turns it into a fishing metropolis? Yeah. That whole area becomes like a giant river where people fish and... Yeah. I mean, because it's the Dead Sea. It's the Dead Sea. And it was where Sodom and Gomorrah was. Mm-hmm. So the other thing that's blowing my mind right now is we just saw the depravity of Israel... And then God's grace and faithfulness yeah. just showered on it in this new celebration city. Yeah. And then it's such a good place that healing water goes out from it. And the first place it flows to is the most famous place of depravity and deadness in yeah. Israel's history. And it heals it. Yeah. And turns it into a place of flourishing in life. That's right. That's what I'm supposed to be That's saying. That's exactly what you're supposed to be I saying. I mean, that is so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what you're supposed to be seeing. Wow. Um, the, the prophecy goes on, but I think this is a good place to pause okay. and just like talk about what we've seen, ask some questions, yeah. talk about Jesus. Okay. Let's do all yeah. those things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question first. Yes. Um, would, was Ezekiel or the people of Israel when they heard this prophecy or he gave this prophecy, this vision, cause he was mm-hmm. told to share this vision. Yeah. It wasn't like, Hey, keep it to yourself, bro. It was like, tell yeah. people this vision. Are they then expecting like, okay, we're going to have to build Celebration City. Is this what we're supposed to make? How do we reroute the river? Like, are it, it, basically what I'm asking mm-hmm. is, was this a picture for them of the next physical temple? Like their, yeah. their physical temple was gone. Right. When Zerubbabel comes back does after the exile, us? is he like, all right, guys, let's get our extra long cubit mm-hmm. stick out and start building. Yeah. So... Scholars obviously disagree. What? <laughs> obviously disagree. That never this. happens. I think it's important to point out that, again, we're never told. No one's ever commanded to build this thing. Right. It, it's, I think the power of it is in the promise it communicates of a future reality where everything is built on rest and freedom. Mm-hmm. I think that's the primary purpose of this, to give us a picture of the new heavens and the new earth, mm. where even deserts in places of judgment are places of life and flourishing. I think it's just, this is showing us a picture of the end of time mm. and what God will do with his people in the end. Okay. However, um, we are told 
what God hopes the description of this new temple will do to the people. Oh, in chapter 43. Okay. In chapter 43, verse 10. Um, As for you, son of man, describe to the house of Israel this temple so that they will be ashamed of their iniquities and measure the plan. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the designs of the temple, Mm. its arrangements, its exits, its entrances, that is, its whole design, and make known to them as well all its statutes and its whole design and all its laws and write it down in their sight so that they may observe all its laws and statutes and carry them out. So maybe getting to what you're saying, maybe Mm -hmm. this is is an implicit command to build it. This is the law of the temple. The whole territory, the top of the mountain, all around shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. So the first thing I want us to notice here is that the purpose of all the measurements that we saw is to shame the people of God Mm -hmm. uh, for what they've done. And so just like let that land, what are you thinking? Um, So what you mean by that is that city is so good. I don't deserve to dwell in it based on the way I've been living. Potentially. I I should have been exiled. I should be kicked out. If that's the city God's building, I have nothing to do with it because my life does not conform to the measurements of Sabbath yeah. and Jubilee and freedom and right. those principles. Yes. Is that what you mean? I think that's what exactly okay. right. It's like they're supposed to look at this city built with sabbatical measures that's sabbatical, a, a, a Jubilee long. And realize they don't measure up. And they don't measure up to mm. it. And the call is to repent. Right. It's to start building lives that look like rest and Jubilee. Mm. Building lives that trust God to do the work to trust his grace, to trust that he will bring the freedom, that he will give them the land back, mm. and that he will forgive their debts. Yeah. Like, I think that's what it's meant to do. This is a picture of God's grace, of the new heavens, the new earth. And it's supposed to shame them for their past sins and trust that God will uh, give it to them. It is interesting to say that he tells them to live out the design of a temple. Yep. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, he's like, this is the, the temple law. Go do it. It was like, wait, no, no, no. I'm supposed to build that. Yes. No, no, no. You build it by living it. And so conform your life with freeing the captors, right. restoring land to its rightful owners, and absolving debt. Yeah. And That's right. And do that. Do that. And then you'll look like Celebration City. Yes. Okay. That's isn't, super cool. Isn't that cool? I love that. And I think it's also interesting. We, t- we talked about this. Like, why? Like, Go ahead. No. Well, throughout Ezekiel... Um, their failure to celebrate the Sabbath is brought up a lot. A lot more than you would think it would be considering all the other terrible stuff they're doing. But now you see why. But now you see why. It's not a judgment of like, hey, you should rest more. It's your lives aren't in conformity with this standard of justice. Yeah. And it's like, and we talked about the, Christina talked about this for a while, but it's like in a, in a, in a way, the command to obey the Sabbath is a summary of all the Bible's laws. Yeah. If you trust God and you and you symbolize that by resting on a particular day, mm. your whole life will look very different, yes. right? Oh, yes. A, a life built on trusting that God will provide <laughs> doesn't look like sleeping around with other idols. Right. It doesn't look like making political deals on the fly. Nope. <laughs> it doesn't look like everything that Israel's been doing. Mm. It looks like trusting God. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so good. So the the, 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 the the Sabbath city, the yeah. celebration city, the freedom city is supposed to say, ah, that's how we're supposed to be living. Yes. In complete dependence on God and so obeying good. God rather than anyway. So then when Jesus calls himself the temple, it's not, I've only, you know, and it, this yeah. is obviously true, taking nothing away from this. Mm-hmm, I've mm-hmm, always mm-hmm, thought mm-hmm, of it mm-hmm. as I am the place where God dwells yep. on earth. Of course that's true. Just as the temple was destroyed by by the Babylon by the Babylonians, my, the temple of my body will be destroyed by the Romans. But just as it, it it was restored and the people of God brought back, so I will be restored in resurrection. I was like, boom, yeah, that's Jesus the temple. But now, it's like, oh, Jesus is the one who lives his life according to the temple measurements. Oh yes, okay, he Continue. is the Sabbath temple 
lived yes. out. His, his, the cubits of the temple mm-hmm. that it's like, live your life by the standard of Sabbath. Jesus does perfectly. Yes. He obeys the temple blueprint. Yes. In the way he lived his life. Yes. Let me put some new flesh on that idea. Okay. So I we were going to get here eventually, but... In John's gospel, hmm. he starts with the temple cleansing. Like the yes. temple cleansing is in John 2, right? right? And uh, Jesus is going to tear it down and build it back up again. So let's just having all this celebration, Sabbath temple, Sabbath city in our minds. And Jesus says, I'm going to build that in myself. Mm-hmm. And the ultimate goal of that is having water that flows out of him and irrigates places of judgment. Heals into, the nations. And he heals the nations. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, John, after that moment becomes somewhat obsessed, not obsessed, but has a lot of water in his gospel. Interesting. The first miracle Jesus does after that moment is water turns water into wine. celebratory wine. Mm. He then, on the Feast of Booths, walks into Jerusalem and says, all who come to me will have rivers of living water flowing out of him. Yep. For the benefit of other people. And he says that like while there's water being brought by the priest up yes. to or out of there's the like temple a there's a door. whole symbol with water. There's a yeah. whole ceremony with water happening. Crazy. He says like if you believe in me, water will flow out of you just as it flew flowed out of rocks in the desert all that time ago. Okay. Right? Yep. When Jesus is killed, when the temple is destroyed, uh huh, in John's gospel, blood and water. Right. Come out of his the tem- side. The temple gushes with water. The temple for gushes the healing with of water. The <laughs> that's oh, right. That's so good. And then when Jesus visits his disciples for the final time, uh huh, they are outside Jerusalem fishing. fishing on water. Fishing on water and gathering more fish than they've ever done before. Which is exactly what Ezekiel says will happen. Yes. Stop. You want to hear? You want to hear it get crazier? Can it? <laughs> so, do you remember how many fish they pick up? No, I don't. They pick up 153 fish. Okay. Weird. Why? Why is that there? Oh, maybe it's just to mark the moment. They were like, "This is a big deal. Let's mark the moment. Let's just count the fish." Yeah. Or John read Ezekiel very, very closely. Yeah. Uh, Saint Augustine. People have been curious about 153 for a long time why 153 fish why 153 yeah, fish? yeah okay saint augustine said it's the triangular number of 17 stop which means one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six all the way up to 17 is 153 okay okay yeah fine great weird detail uh let me just read this to you and fishermen will stand beside the sea from engedi to Englaim. it'll be a place of spreading the nets and it'll be fish of every kind okay in hebrew uh, Hebrew letters also stand for Hebrew numbers, right? Yes, right. Uh, and so you can also just add up letters to make sums. Yep. So the two cities mentioned, En Gedi. Uh. The numerical value of En Gedi is 17. And the numerical value of En Glaim is 153. Ah. Uh. So perhaps John was reading Ezekiel very, very well knew that when the temple is destroyed and a new temple of Sabbath rest would be built, water would flow out, people would begin fishing again. And then he's like, and how many fish do we catch, guys? 153, just like the end of Ezekiel. Whoa. <laughs> is that crazy? That is I don't, crazy. That one feels like the most, like, I was like that one feels really weird and like yeah. some weird math happening. But considering all the other parallels John is making. Oh my gosh, yeah. I'm kind of all in. Yeah, that that's fascinating. Ezekiel sees Jesus as the sabbath city Mm -hmm. the man who brings sabbath and jubilee rest and the flowing of the rivers of life from the temple have already begun and the disciples were the first ones to experience it gathering fish out of the valley of destruction okay can i tell you what's the biggest thing actually blowing my mind right now yes and it's not what i expected it would be is if i'm hearing you right and we haven't yet talked about the eschatological kingdom oh no we haven't but I'm almost I'm almost like not wanting to go there because what is actually being said is he's describing Sabbath people. Mm, yes. Because he's live the blueprint. Yeah. Is what he's telling you to do. Yeah. And then Jesus lived the blueprint and he says, Oh, if you come to me, my spirit will be in you and living water will flow out of you and you'll live the blueprint mm-hmm. and you'll heal the nations. Yep. 
That's right. And it's like, we are little Sabbath cities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rightly aligning ourselves with the extra long read, resting, trusting, doing justice in the world. And our houses in our neighborhoods become little celebration cities that water our neighbors Mm -hmm. and the city around us and the orphans in our city and the injustices in our, in our towns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we become little perfect square cities. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that's so good. We're, we're, yeah. That's just like, that to me is like the best passage I've ever read in the Bible about us being like a living temple mm-hmm. of like live the blueprint. Yes. Is like one of the coolest things I've read yes. in a long time, I feel like. That's very yeah, neat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, but we should talk about what does this have to do with the new heavens and the new earth? Right. Because we also get a picture right in Revelation of a description of a city. I think we get cubits again in we, Revelation. We don't get cubits. We, we get a different unit of measurement. Okay. But the city of god is described as a perfect cube okay the temple here is a perfect square okay um which it, it represents the holy of holies right the holy yeah, of the holies holy of a holy perfect square yeah it was a perfect cube okay. yeah, yeah yeah uh there's water running out this mentions healing mm-hmm. john oh, right. mentions healing yep. and, and there's a river that heals the nations in ex- revelation that's okay. exactly right uh, so it's all very, very much connected. John is making a ton of use of Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. And John is interpreting that, these passages, not as dis- descriptive of another temple, mm-hmm. but of the end of time. Yeah, This is a picture of what it looks like when God comes back and remakes the entire world. Yes. A Sabbath city forever. Oh. Um, yes. Yeah. So what we what we see here are a few things. We see the city God is building in order to shame (laughs) us in our sin and cause us to repent and align ourselves with the blueprint. Yeah. To live the blueprint of a Sabbath city right now. Yeah. And to live in that reality Mm -hmm. right now. We see it ultimately lived out in the person of Jesus. He was the ultimate Sabbath city come to earth, lived out in perfect... Water flowed from his side. Yeah. He lived the blueprint perfectly. (laughs) We now have his spirit inside of us, which we've talked about being, yeah, that's better. Yeah. He's made us into like to have new hearts and he's our new shepherd that guides us uh, into yeah. new life. The dry bones came to life. Yes. And now we live in the Sabbath city now and uh, we join together with other members of the church and we live in this big churchy Sabbath We're city. We're all being built up together yes. into a holy temple of God. And, yes. But all of that is still looking forward to a time when God will do to the earth what he had to do to our hearts Mm. that the whole world is like a hard heart yeah and it needs to be completely just remade it's dry bones and it needs to be raised to life yeah and he's going to come to this old earth with its old brokenness that couldn't ever really achieve the full sabbath city measurements that it's supposed to and he will do it just Mm -hmm. like he did it in our hearts yeah but he'll do it to the whole world yep that's exactly right beautiful and Ezekiel even talks about the fact that this Sabbath city, this new Sabbath world, is for everyone, not just for Jewish people. Okay. Because we we've I have we haven't really talked about this yet, but like everything's been covenant related, land right. related, yeah. all this kind of stuff. Uh, but Ezekiel, in these last chapters, start he does this whole thing in the last section. He divides up the land again. Mm. So after the temple's built, um. He basically says, okay, here's the 12 tribes of Israel, and here's Dan, you're going to get this land, and Judah, you're going to get this land, and everyone gets an equal measure, and it's it's great. If you've you've read the land allotment passages in In Joshua, Joshua. you kind of know what's happening in this section. But for the first time, I believe in the Bible, Mm. um, we're told that foreigners, so Gentiles, people that are not Jewish, can own and keep land in god's new country whoa forever yeah that's different it's different and whatever is happening right here includes all people of the world Mm -hmm. where all people of the world are inheritors of not god's new kingdom yeah so we're i think i think we're exactly right not to see this as a temple to be built one day yes or maybe that ezra thought he was building Mm. i think it's a picture of the the new heavens and the new earth that's being built right now and will one day cover the earth as waters cover the sea come lord jesus come lord jesus you want you want to know the last thing if i can handle it the last words of the book of ezekiel okay um 
uh, he he describes the city one last time. He says it's a perfect square, eight you know, whole bunch of cubits by a whole bunch of cubits, perfect okay. square. Then he names the city. And the name of the city from that time on shall be the Lord is there. <laughs> Where's God's throne chariot been? It's been in Babylon. Yeah. It was in Israel. It left Israel. Yeah. It came back to Israel. And where will it be for all time? There. There. <laughs> the Lord is there. Oh. The, the ending promise of Ezekiel is that God will always be with his people. Oh my gosh. Forever. Where are you going to live later? <laughs> Where God is. Where God is. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's that's so really good. Yes. Oh, man. This has been awesome. Uh, I yeah. love this. Well, thank you, Seth. Thank you, Christine, for helping us walk through the book of Ezekiel. Thank you all for joining us as we've walked through it. I hope it's been really beneficial yeah. to you. I've loved it so much. I hope you guys read the book of Ezekiel. It was yeah. pretty powerful to, to walk through. I feel like I can now. So thank yeah. you for that, Seth. <laughs> I really do appreciate it. Well, again, we so appreciate the time that you guys give us to uh, listen as we speak and walk through the Bible. And thank you uh, for your support and spreading the word. We, uh, we just love to get to do this alongside you. So thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next time.